Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. Someone asked, uh, where is it? I just saw that. Hold on, where, where is it? Hmm, I wonder why Corey chose that thumbnail. Uh, well, you know what? What is the thumbnail? I forgot. That's sad because, oh, me with the bald guy, the greatest prophet ever. That's why. That's why. Yeah, you, you, whenever you get to highlight a bald person, you do so, you know? So anyway, <laughs> hope you all are doing well. Hope you all are doing wonderful. I uh, hope you all had a wonderful weekend. I did. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I have been a somewhat of a bachelor for the last, when did my wife go out of town? Wednesday? Thursday? Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. So she comes back this evening. As a matter of fact, once I leave here, once we get off here, I have to go pick her up. So hope you all are doing well. But let's go ahead and jump into our Bible study. We are going to pick up. I don't know if things are picking up, slowing down. We're going deeper. Uh, it varies, obviously, from from uh, from from chapter to chapter, from book to book. So we're going to go to Second Kings, chapter one, verse one. Uh, we'll skip past the the demise of Ahab. We covered most of it. We covered most of Ahab uh, and his and his wife. Now all of what's happening with a with with his wife hadn't happened just yet. But let's go ahead and and jump into it. And here we take off in Second Kings. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Ahab had a lot of chances. Ahab had shot after shot after shot. Kind of like what God gives us. Uh, and Ahaziah, ah, ah, these names. Ahaziah, which is sound, is spelled or, or pronounced differently in Hebrew, but Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber, which was in Samaria, and became ill. Now, listen what he does. He sends messengers and said to them, Go, inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I will recover from this sickness. It's almost as though they, did, they didn't see what happened when these prophets of Baal went up against or had this confrontation with Elijah. It's almost like they're not paying attention or, or they don't really care. So he says, Whether I will recover from the sickness. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise and go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that, that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you shall surely die. Then Elijah departed. So we're getting a recount of what the Lord says to, and I believe this is the Lord, the angel of the Lord, what he says to Elijah to go tell this man. So when the messengers returned to him, he said to them, why have you returned? They said to him, a man came up to meet us and said to us, go return to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now, something already has just jumped off the page to me. There's something that is, is noticeable already. One, these men encounter one man. They don't know who this man is. So think about this for a second. Why would they decide to just turn around, take the word of this man, even though he says, thus says the Lord, why would they just take his word and go back to their king? It's kind of interesting, right? They don't, they don't remember. They don't know who this man is. They describe the man. They describe this man. And that was that. So they go back and they tell the man. Now, here's the reason why I believe so. The Bible doesn't say so, but here's the reason why I believe so. And I think this is kind of inferred. You didn't just go around saying that you were some prophet. You didn't just go around saying that God had spoken something to you. That was just not something that just rolled off your, off your lips in those days. If you stated that the Lord said something, it had better be the Lord or else you don't have to worry about other people. You have to worry about God. And so in this case, when someone says something, it's almost like what, what things used to be like. You know, we talk about the, the so-called good old days. And when we say good old days, we mean days that are better than what they are now in terms of the way people handle themselves. And it used to be that there was a time where you took people's words, you gave a little bit more credibility to people's words some time ago. Now, if someone tells you 
that it's 100 degrees out and you're outside with them, you still don't you still don't necessarily believe them. You have to take people's words with a grain of salt nowadays. Whereas back then, it used to be that your word meant something. What was the old saying? Some of you all older heads, well, you will remember this term when it says your word is bond or your word is your bond. In other words, you used to be able, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, that's not just a saying, that was actually the case. You could be, you could be let off and you, you still have these nowadays. You have a, uh, a bond that's issued by the court if you're ever in trouble. And it's a bond where it's basically on your own recognizance. In other words, your word. Well, that's because people's words used to mean something. You didn't have to put up collateral. You didn't have to promise to be back. If you said you're going to be back, it's what it was. A handshake. As a matter of fact, it used to be that if you said something verbally, that was considered to be a contract. Laws have changed a little bit. If you gave a handshake, that used to be a contract. So nowadays, though, you'll shake someone's hand and and sign a, sign your name on the dotted line and give a verbal consent and still be lying. Have no intent whatsoever. So in some cases, Brittany, she says uh, verbal contracts are legally defensible. One, it depends on in, in certain cases, in certain states and the dollar amounts. Uh, I know it used to be when I was a young pup, it used to be $500. Uh, on a financial business contract, anything over that amount. And, and, it, and again, it varies from state to state. You might have a different law in Alaska versus in Texas versus in California versus in New York and so forth. So, But anyway, the point is our words used to mean something. God would hold you accountable to your word. Remember the children of Israel when the sons made a deal with those men who, remember Dinah was, was defiled, and so what did the two boys do? They go and make a deal and they lose out on the blessing from Jacob because their word was not kept. You don't make a vow and then break a vow. Uh, even when someone, when an enemy of the children of Israel, I think it was, I think it was the Gibeonites, I can't, I can't remember, but I think it was the Gibeonites that even tricked the children of Israel, but the children of Israel made a vow and so Joshua held them to it because they made a vow. Your word meant something. And so here we've got this man before these people, even before the heathens, they took his word to mean something. And so he goes back. He said to them, what kind of man was he who came up to meet you and spoke these words to you? They answered, he was a hairy man. Man had hair on him, hair all over the place. I'm pretty sure he had a full, beautiful, lovely head of hair. That was that was the old that was the old testament guys, that was under the law. That's when uh, a lot of hair was beautiful if you were a man. Nowadays, not so much. Anyway, they said answered him. He was a hairy man with a leather girdle bound about his loins, and he said, "Ah, it is Elijah the Tishbite." Now he knows who Elijah is. This is how ignorant he is. This is how this is. <laughs> This man, listen, if there ever was a person who was stupid, it's this person. Why? Haven't you seen what happened with the prophets of Baal? Haven't you heard? Didn't you know? Well, you're going to find out because something similar happens that way. Then, verse 9, the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50, and he went up to him, and behold, he was sitting on top of the hill, and he said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. Why are you calling him man of God? Well, you know he's a man of God. Uh, Elijah rep replied to the captain of 50, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed his 50. How many times would it take for this to happen? You, you would think, you would think it would take one time to get the lesson. It would take one time for to see you speaking to a man of God, you know who it is, fire comes down, and you decide, you decide, let's send somebody else. Matter of fact, the, the issue that you're upset with him about is he's upset with Elijah because God, not Elijah, but God said, you shall not recover from your injuries. You are going to die. You're mad at Elijah because something God says, which by the way, we have that happening nowadays. People get upset. They get incensed because of what God said. Wait a minute. I didn't write these words. These didn't come out of my mouth. I'm repeating them, but they didn't originate with me. 
I am not the genesis of this book. So in certain cases, when we're talking about women or we're talking, talking about certain spiritual gifts or things like that, you, you can't get mad at me. All I'm simply doing is repeating. Well, I think your interpretation is off. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Why are you getting upset? Because you think my interpretation is flawed. If my interpretation is flawed, well, then fine. Why are you worried about that? Why don't you just keep keep moving? But that's not the way he wants it. He wants the exact revenge. Okay. Again, not the smartest person. Verse 11. So he again sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he said to him, oh, man of God, thus says the king, come down quickly. Now, I can I can imagine what's happening, what's going through this captain's head. Well, pretty soon fire. Elijah replied to them, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 then fire of, then fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. So again, this moron king, this idiot king, Corey, you shouldn't call him a moron. This guy's a moron. This guy's now going to send his third 50. I wonder how many captains of 50 would he have sent out if he had the opportunity to. I wonder how many of these, how many times he would have, he would have pursued this man. So again, he sent out a captain, a third 50 with his 50. When the third captain of 50 went up, he came and did the right thing. He came and bowed down. He came and bowed down his knees before Elijah and begged him and said to him, O oh man of God, please let my life and the lives of the, these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the first two captains with their 50s, but now let my life be precious in your sight. Listen, can you please spare us? Can you just don't do that, please? I I work for this idiot king. I, not my fault. It's just, you know, what are you going to do, right? So could you please not kill us today? So the angel of the Lord steps in because I think sometimes God just wants to see who is going to be obedient. Who maybe it's not this guy over here. Maybe it's not this goofy king who doesn't know what he's going to do, who's, who's dying anyway. Maybe it's not him. Maybe he wants to see how others respond. Because sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, in this world of ours, there are powers that are doing things that we cannot affect. Neither you nor I are going to have an effect on what Joe Biden's going to do or what Donald Trump is going to do. As a matter of fact, there are times that we wish both of them would go away. But this is what we have. We've got the Congress that we have. We may have one of the dumbest Congress ever in the history of, of, of the world. But they're our Congress women, women and men, senators and so forth. Sometimes it's not necessarily up for us. I'm not saying don't try to do things or fix things if you can. But sometimes God wants to see your response. Sometimes God wants to see if you're going to bow your knee to him, irrespective of what Congress or what the government or what your boss or what your friends, your family members are going to do. Maybe that's what God is looking for. God is looking for you to know. Because what was the statement that was made uh, to, for uh, for Elijah to tell uh, Ahaz Ahaziah? Is it because there's no God in Israel? Well, since you know there's a God in Israel, bow down. Since you know there's a God, bow down. That's all. This is what God has always been after from Genesis even up to this part where they are now, even to where we are, all God has ever wanted us to do was to bow down, to serve him, to follow him, to be faithful to him. That's all, he, that's all he's ever wanted. The book that we have, that we read, is about us having faith in him, following him. That's what it's about. And in doing so, we get to stay with him forever in eternity. That's all he's after. But no, this guy, there, these are times where you want to just unleash the words. You know, there are words you want to call someone, but you don't want to call them because they might be a Christian. But you can call this person because they're not a Christian. You know, you want to call a guy an imbecile. You want to call a guy a nincompoop, a moron. That's, that's what this guy is. This guy is all of those times 10. So the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him. He's going to go back to the king. So... Then he said to him, thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, is it because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? So there's no God you couldn't, you couldn't consult me. Okay. Now, the reason why you should have consulted me is because I alone give life and death. No one takes life. 
no one gives life. Not the devil, uh, not your grandma, not your ma, your pa, not the government, not the good old U.S. of A. No one gives life nor takes life. If someone were to do something to you, if an arrow was shot through your head and God didn't want you to live, I mean, God wants you to live, you'll live. You'll live. If, if someone just blew on you and God wants you to die, you'll die. He gives life. He takes life. Could you imagine if the devil had the power to take lives? Could you imagine if he had that kind of power? He doesn't. But since God has life, you didn't, you didn't inquire about God. You didn't inquire to him. You went somewhere else. Okay, well, fine. Let them save you. And so he says, therefore, you shall not come down from your bed where you have gone, but you shall surely die. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And because he had no son, Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the king of Israel? Now, here is a book. Here is a book that's worth mentioning. We don't know what it says. It's referenced a few times, but we don't know. So there are books in the Bible that are referenced that we don't know. There's not just one book. As a matter of fact, we're going to hear about a book called the Book of Life later on. We haven't gotten there yet. Uh, but there's also a book of the living. The book of the living and the book of life are not the same books. One is the book where just these are the folks that are alive right now. Then the book of life, those are folks that will be alive forever. And you've got other books, the book of the Chronicles of the King of Israel, other book, other books that chronicle other things. Amen. Just because we have other books don't mean that some, some are heavenly books. Some are books by men. This is a book by men. And this book is not intended to be part of the canon. Okay. Someone's going to ask that question because we tend to get someone to ask that question or a question like that when we see or hear about another book. Now, here we're going to get to the good part. Here, we, here we're going to go to one of the greatest prophets ever. And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, by the way, do y'all know what these, what their names mean? Uh, Elisha is the Lord who saves. Elijah is the Lord, my God, or my God, the Lord, my God. So I'm going to, uh, just so I don't confuse you while I'm going over these two, I'll say J and S. Okay. That way, because folks have said, Corey, I couldn't tell if you said Elisha when you meant, this, or if you said Elijah when you said Elisha. So therefore, I will say J and S. So a whirlwind took up J with when I'm sorry, with, I'm sorry, let me back up, let me back up. And it came about when the Lord was about to take up uh, EJ by whirlwind to heaven that EJ went with ES from Gilgal. And EJ said to ES, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But ES said, as the Lord lives, as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then the sons of the prophet who were who were at Bethel came out to ES and said to him, do you now know or do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Be still. This phrase right here, be still, is just simply to say, please be quiet. I, I don't I don't want to hear about it. Just all right. Fine. Quiet. It's all, it's all, it's all it means. This word be still means be still or be quiet. Keep silent. All right, fine, I get it. So, verse four, a lot, I'm sorry, EJ said to him, ES, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So, the, so they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophet who were at Jericho approached ES and said to him, do you not know? The same thing, second time. Stop telling me this. It's almost like, hey, we got something to tell you. Did you know, did you know, did you know? And he says the same thing. Um, yes, I know. Please be still. Stop. Be quiet, please. Then, then EJ said to him, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Sometime this week, we're going to cover what the son and the, the sons of the prophets and the school of the prophets are. We won't do it for uh, for now, but suffice to say, one, we don't know who they are. We don't know their names. Uh, and doesn't mean that all of them are actually actual um, prophets in the sense that that Elijah or Elijah were. Uh, these were typically people who were 
Um, it, 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 it almost would, for some, depending on who you're asking, may convey uh, what scribes were. They, were, they, they kept the word, uh, would respond to the word, would uh, repeat the word. Now, at this moment, they only have the words that were written um, by a few, by obviously by Moses and Joshua and so forth. So now there were pro other prophets that actually um, gave a word of the Lord. And it could be this where they came from. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Elijah took his mantle. I'm sorry, EJ. <laughs> EJ took his mantle, folded it together, and struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. I think it's the third time that this has happened. When they had crossed over, EJ said to ES, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And ES said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Now, a couple things. He's asking for a double portion. Nowadays, we hear people in these churches and so forth that just don't pay attention to scripture that might make the statement that I want a double portion. Now, this is the only time that we see this happening. OK, now the whatever the anointing or whatever the, the spirit that's upon Elijah, it's not Elijah's to give. It's not Elijah's to give. It's God's to give. Now, it seems as though Elijah is speaking a little too confidently about if you see this and it will happen. Now, remember, he wanted he's a prophet. But two, Elijah remembers something that Elijah did. Remember, it was not. Elijah's idea, this was God's idea to tell him to go and to anoint Elisha. Yes. First Kings chapter 19, verse 16, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel. You remember this story? And Elisha, yes, the son of Shaphat Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. So in other words, God tells him that you are going to anoint this man as prophet in your place. He is going to take your place. And though, remember, he goes and gets Elisha, E-S, he goes and gets him. So God has already told him he's going to be taken. He's going to take your place in your place, not as a prophet. He's not saying you're going to anoint him as prophet, just as a prophet. We've got prophets, but as someone that's going to take his place. And so he already knows that there are going to be some things that are going to be done at his hand. Now, I want you all to notice something, one, about Elijah J E J and Elisha E S. I want you to know something about them. We talked about this before, and this is vitally important. How when we go back and let's put this where is it at? On I didn't pull it up. Let me pull it up right here. We talked about this before. As we go through the Old Testament, all of the books that we have read thus far, all of the the different um, books, chapters, and verses, and so forth, all the different prophets, all the different writers, all of those that are speaking. How many times? Can we point to where there was someone who in the Bible, God would have miracles happening really on the regular, normally at a man's hand? How many times can we think about it from Genesis up to now we're in 2 Kings? How often did it happen where signs and wonders were happening at the hands of a man? Not how often were signs and wonders happening with God all the time. But how many times did we see a man doing something, either laying his hand on something, waving his hand, or what have you? Well, let's think back. Let's go back to our our little uh, uh, timeline. In Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we see Moses. And then by extension, we also see there's one other person. There's one other person who also had some signs at his hand. Now, shouldn't be too difficult for you all to get this get this answer for who this person was to have some signs at his. That's right, Katrina. Joshua. Remember, Joshua is a ladder, a ladder extension of Moses. They're going into the promised land. And as a matter of fact, the second time that waters were parted were at Joshua's hand. Sometimes we forget about that. They were at Joshua's hand. And so, by the way, we see that Joshua was around Moses often. We talk about when, when uh, at the mountain and so forth, when, when God shows up and so forth, like, wait, wait a minute, Joshua was there? Yeah, Joshua has been around a lot. 
young well he was younger then obviously he got older but a little bit of Moses obviously the end of Moses ministry fell upon Joshua and so the last person that we saw power at a person's hands was Joshua but mainly Moses okay that was it after that we didn't let's go back to the screen back to the Old Testament timeline we don't see anyone else whether it be um, in Judges first and second we don't see anyone else now we do see things happening that's not to say that we don't see we don't see um, miracles happening you think about someone like um, Samson God empowering him for that you see someone like um, who's the guy the guy that took the jawbone uh, and slayed the people not not the jawbone the uh, axe gourd I can't think of the man's name so you would see some things happening that God is doing. You would see different, but but in terms of signs and wonders happening at the power or under someone's hand, only Moses. And then at after that, uh, just for a little while, in the hands of Joshua, and then we see Elijah, E J, and now we're going to see it Elisha, E S. Okay. No, no, I wouldn't say Jonah. Uh, oh, but by the way, T T, we haven't gotten to Jonah yet. We haven't gotten there yet, so. Uh, so, so therefore, we can't. We couldn't use him. But even if we did, he, you wouldn't say with Jonah. Uh, let's go back to it. He said, "You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken uh, from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so." Now, here's a question: Is it possible that a person can pass on the gift of the Spirit, or in this case, the Spirit, to another man? This is the first time that we see it happening. And it's the only time we do see. And by the way, it's always God that does so. It's God that will do so. It's not a man that will do so. We see it happening with David and Saul. Saul, the spirit leaves Saul and then goes to David. It's the Holy Spirit. Now, can someone else be empowered by the Holy Spirit more than just one person? Sure. Obviously, it's the Holy Spirit. Oh, by the way, that's not, that's not the same as someone being gifted by the Holy Spirit. Because remember, God even gifted people to, to, to be builders and art workers uh, for different parts of, let's say, when they're when they're constructing uh, the art and so forth. So God can always empower someone for, for anything. OK, but what we're talking about, we don't see the Bible ever saying that a person can, let's say, impart spiritual gifts. Now, let's time, time out because the question was asked earlier, so I want to go cover it again. If someone says, well, wait a second, in the New Testament, Paul says, I desire to come to you that I might in, impart, and then the word says spiritual gift, and we, we covered this before, the word that's used there is pneumaticon, so something spiritual. As a matter of fact, that's what he says, something spiritual, spiritual things. So it's just giving what giving the spirit. I want to, I want to give you something that is of the spirit. Now, however the Lord uses it, however the Lord turns it or moves it, that's a him thing. That's a God thing, not a me thing. You cannot give someone the spirit of God. You cannot give uh, someone the spirit. Of God. Can the Holy Spirit leave someone? Then, yes. T t today, now, no. Uh, because the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is a lot different. It's vastly different now than it is then. Then it was upon people. Today, it's in us. But we'll come back to that some other time. So, going to it. If you, as a matter of fact, he does say so in, uh, even though we haven't gotten there yet, Jeremiah 32 is one where he says that. Let me ask this question too. Uh, he says, was EJ, <laughs> Elijah, one of the witnesses in the great tribulation? I heard some scholars believe. It could be. We have, we have no idea. It could be Elijah, could be Moses, could be Enoch. Now we're going to talk about those. Matter of fact, uh, Rant Man Sam. Uh, with a beautiful, with a beautiful, and I mean absolutely gorgeous hairdo. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, we're going to talk about them in just a second. So you bringing that up, the reason why you brought that up is because you're bald. And so the Lord is the Lord is clearly and mightily moving through you. So we're going to cover that. He didn't even know we're going to talk about that. But we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Let's go back to the text. So as they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire. And I've been meaning to watch that movie. I still haven't watched it. All I know is the song. You know, the, the music. Dun, 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 dun. 
I, I, everyone knows the song. You couldn't get it from what I just said, but if you heard the song played from the, the theme for the movie Chairs of Fire, anyway, that every time I hear this story, I think about that. A chair of fire and horses of fire appeared, I'm sorry, which separated the two of them, and EJ Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elijah, yes, saw it and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw EJ Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Today, too often, too often, people have this idea, this thought about taking the mantle of someone else. So we've seen goofy prophets today, false prophets, having a mantle, a shawl, whatever, and then laying it on someone else. I don't think people understand what it means to be a prophet. We're going to look at that in just a little bit, what an actual prophet is, the life of a prophet. The mantle was just really a, a symbol. The mantle was really more of a symbol because what happens was, was going to be this anointing, the Holy Spirit coming upon him. Verse 13, he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and he struck the water saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Now he's speaking metaphor, I mean, not metaphorically, he, he's speaking um, kind of facetiously, he's not asking the question, where is the Lord? No, he's making a pronouncement. And when he had also had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elijah crossed over, E.S. crossed over. I'll go back to saying Elisha now because E.J. is gone. <laughs> now, when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him saw him, they said, the spirit of E.J. Elijah rests on Elisha, and they came to meet him and bow themselves to the ground before him. We've covered this kind of briefly before. We'll do it later on. But when you hear this term, the spirit of something, a spirit of this, a spirit of that, think in terms of, in some cases, in many cases, it's an attitude of. But in this case, it's not an attitude of. It's not an attitude of Elijah. What this, what this is, is the spirit that was on Elijah. Okay? It wasn't necessarily his spirit. It was a spirit that was on Elijah, uh, rest on Elisha, and they came to meet him, bowed themselves to the ground before him. They said, and behold, now there are with your servants, 50 strong men. Please let them go and search for your master. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him on some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not sin. No, don't, no, there's, there's no need for you to go looking for him. EJ is gone. No. But what do they say? No, no, no. They, they're, they're just pressing him. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, fine, go look for him. Take your time. Take your time. Go look for him. I'll, I'll, I'll see you when you get back. They returned uh, to him while he was staying at Jericho. And he said, he said, did, did I not say to you, don't go? I told you don't go, but you wanted to go. So fine. Um, I'm sorry, looking at the question. Then the men of the city said, Elisha, behold, now the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new jar and put salt in it. So they, so they brought it to him. He went out to, uh, to the spring of the water and threw salt in it and said, thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters. There shall not be from there death or unfruitfulness any longer. That's odd. You're going to throw some, some salt in this water. Now, there's a reason why I'm reading this and, and we're getting close to being through with this part and we're going to make another statement, but there's a reason why I'm reading this. One, that's an odd thing to do, but he's a prophet. Someone made a statement, matter of fact, in one of the roundtable discussions, and I've heard other folks say that if you got, if, if certain folks were to see a miracle or if a true man of God were to say something, you folks wouldn't believe it. Ah, not so fast. Not, not so fast. I think it was, I'm not sure if it was, if it was Michael Brown, if it was Sam Storms. One of those said, if you were to see, no, it was Sam Storms. He said, speaking about certain miracles or, or I'm not sure which one it was, but if, if someone said some odd things or some odd things were done, you guys wouldn't believe it. Would you believe it? Well, sure. 
Here's the reason why you would believe it. Here's the reason why you would believe what Elijah said. Here's the reason why you would believe what Elisha says. Here's the reason why you would believe any of the prophets of God. You know why? They have a track record. They don't lie. We know who they are. We have seen things at their hand. Okay? Again, Elisha, before he does this, when he, where he says, go give me the salt and put the salt in there, before he does this, what did Elisha just do? Is Elijah, now, now that he's stating this, or he's doing this, is there a reason for them to trust him? Let's go back. He says, bring me a new jar and put salt in it. That doesn't make any sense, Elijah. But who, who is Elijah? He's the guy that just took the mantle and struck it and divided the river. So guess what? We can trust him. Why can we trust Elijah? Because he's got a track record. There are proofs. What he has said by the name of God has happened. Unlike today, we've got folks that will say something with no proof, no track record. What they do, what, what we do, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They do give us something. There is a track record with these modern day prophets. There is a track record. We can't say they haven't given us anything. They've given us excuses. They've given us excuses. They've given us uh, reasons to distrust, if you weren't a Christian, reasons to distrust the word of the Lord. Well, see, what happened was they've given us um, bad results. They've given us failures and said, well, I heard from the Lord. I just gave it the wrong way. You do realize the whole point of a prophet. Y'all, listen, a prophet, the Hebrew word, same as the Greek word, is to utter, to inform, to tell to reveal this is your job the prophet's job is this right here the these two lips the tongue the teeth the cheeks the saliva all of that the throat the esophagus all of that that's your job god is going to implant it your job is this so if you're failing with this part then shut this part if you can't get this right well then all you then be quiet from now on hush quiet please because you will incur God's wrath. Now, just because the Bible is not telling us nowadays to stone you or to kill you, doesn't mean he won't. Doesn't mean that God won't, and doesn't mean that he won't make an example out of you unless you repent. Thank God for grace for some of these people. You say these things and you glance over it as though it's easy, it, it, it's okay, it's fine. But what you are doing is you are messing around with God's name. God will destroy a city he will destroy a county. He will destroy a nation for the sake of his name. Don't believe me? Ask the children of Israel. Ask them what God would do. And oh, by the way, just because we're here in America, just because we've got internet and just because we've got iPhones and even some of you blasphemous folks with these Android phones, just because we've got Apple computers and PCs and so forth, just because we've got all these streaming network devices and we got AC and running water, you mean tell me God can't touch us? Yes, he can. You mean tell me you think God has devalued his own name just because you came along? Just because you're born, you think that God is okay with you messing around with, with his name? You think God is fine with you defiling, profaning his name? You think so? Okay, let me ask you guys a question. We covered this before, and we're going to cover it some more because we, we've got other passages that we're going to look to. God said, what did God give the children of Israel to enjoy them, to enjoy him? Does anybody remember what God gave the children of Israel to enjoy him? Put it on the screen. I want to see if you guys, what did God give the children of Israel? Uh, he gave them a, a wonderful present to enjoy him. I want to see if someone gets this. And doggone it, you doggone smart Christians, I know you get it. I know you're going to get it because you're smart Christians. There's there's no group of um, Christian uh, folks that what? No, not the temple, not the quail. <laughs> not his law, something about his law, though. No, not, no, not even law, before the law. The land, doggone it, I, do I have to retract this? <laughs> I'm about to go to another channel and get me. Come on, we, we said this before. We said this before. What did God give them to someone? Okay, wait a second. Wait, blasphemy. 
The man said hair. No, he did not. No, he did. Y'all put y'all put Dutch in timeout. Not bacon. He did give him bacon. No, he didn't give him bacon. He didn't give him bacon. <laughs> Miles said bacon. No, he didn't. But that he gave us bacon. What did he give him? What? Yes. The covenant. Just, promise. Freedom. <laughs> Android. What did God give the children of Israel? He gave them something to enjoy him. There you go. There you go. Ran 0893. The Sabbath. Now, he didn't say it all that confidently because he put a question mark there, but that's fine. He gave them the Sabbath. He gave them the, the they, thank you, uh, Berean Babe. He gave them the Sabbath. Now, do y'all think that that was important to God? Do you think the Sabbath was important uh, for God and them? Yes, very important, very important. What did that, do y'all, we covered this before. We cover it, so we we don't have the passage just yet. We hadn't gotten there just yet. But we covered this before. Do y'all remember, we went over this, where God says, you know what? Fine, have your Sabbath, have your feast, have your new moon, have all of those. I'm out. For a second time, we won't cover that before, but someone will say, wait a second, no, he didn't. Yeah, the Lord said, I'm not in your Sabbath, your feast, no more. I'm out. You keep keeping them. Fine. You keep, you keep observing the Sabbath. You keep observing them. God said, nope, not me anymore. There will be another Sabbath. Doesn't mean that he forgot about the actual Sabbath day and that they still have these Sabbaths. No, but, <laughs> but, but he says, because you have defiled and profaned my name in your Sabbaths, I won't be in them anymore. Now, there will be another Sabbath that will transcend not just the Jews, but all of man that is in Christ, those Jews that are in Christ and those Gentiles that are in Christ. Why am I saying that? Because if you are going to do that to his name, don't think he's going to have any pleasure in you anymore. God takes his word and his name serious. And so for you to come back and say, for you to come back and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, um, God said, and it wasn't, it wasn't so, and we got a problem. We got a problem. And don't think that just because the law is not around anymore that God has, he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't have any concern about his name. Now, the only reason why he's going to save Israel is because he says, not because of their wonderful, their great, no, but because of my great name, I'll do this. Because I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob before any of you goofballs were born, not you guys, but these the, but the Jews that, that defiled him, I made this promise. And so I'm going to keep it. And so that so that Israel won't be a byword and proverb. And why has God done this great violence to his house, to his people? And God will go back and remember the promise that he has and have compassion. But not before he drags you all through the mud, through the dirt, over some bricks, over some glass. He didn't, Dexter said, what, when God rested on the seventh day, what type of rest? The word that's rest is, is the same word for, for cease. He ceased his work. He didn't rest. He didn't. That was nothing. God could do everything and just, just like, matter of fact, doing that would be too much for God if he wanted just a word. But he just, he just ceased. In all of his work, he ceased. So, so when he makes a statement, bring me a jar and put salt in it, well then, they understand he's a prophet. And he is a prophet like who? Like Elijah. Now, let's pause for a second. Because I want us to, I want us to, as we're going, ladies and gentlemen, we are to be making observations of the text as we're going. I want to back up for a second. We are in Second Kings, chapter one. That was no, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter two, verse twenty. I have a question. I've asked you guys this before. I want to see if you guys remember this. And I will allow you to go to other passages. Do y'all recall what, matter of fact, let's do this. Let's, let's put it right here. Uh, second Kings. Do y'all remember this? Let's read this passage again. And it came about when, when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven, that Elijah went to Elisha. Now let's drop down. Cause I, we, I want to figure out something. See if you guys can 
can help me understand this. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me slide down. Here it is. Um, oh, here it is. I'm sorry. Verse, verse 11. As they were going along, talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Here's my question, ladies and gentlemen. I want to see if you guys remember this. I want, I want to see if you guys remember this. Where did Elijah go? Let me grab my coffee cup. Where, where did Elijah go? And listen, I'm, while, while you guys are answering the question, all you guys with Android phones, I'm praying for you. I will be I will be interceding for you all tonight. May the Lord bless and touch you people. But where did Elijah go? Wendy says heaven. Katrina says heaven. Rant Man Sam says heaven. <laughs> Monk Moose said, hmm. Uh, Wayne Marsh says Abraham bosoms. Berean Bay. Violet says Elijah went up. Up, up, up. Cephas Rock said heaven. Uh, A. Renee said paradise. Rantman Sam again says the Lord. Dutch says not heaven. <laughs> she says, I don't know. Cindy said <laughs> first heaven. He went to heaven. It's just which heaven? He went to heaven. Just which heaven? Amen. Not the third heaven. But wait a second. It lit, what, what, Corey, it said he went up to heaven. Yeah. And if all we had was this text, if all we had was this text, I would have to say, I would have to assume he went up to the heaven, the heaven with, with, with God, the father, he went to be with him. But as we kind of parse this thing, we, we, we have to think about something. Now we don't get there yet. We don't know this yet, but to go be with the father in his presence, this body, this flesh, this mortality can't go that way. This corruptible flesh can't go, right? But it's possible that God would have given him an incorruptible flesh. It's possible that he could have been given a, a heavenly body. It's possible. It's possible. And someone said, and presumably, presumably Enoch. There's one, and, and by the way, I would even say Enoch and Elijah, EJ, I would have said that, you know what, they went to heaven. There's one passage, and even someone said, well, 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 well the passage in Hebrews about Enoch says that he went, no, 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 it's, it's, just, it's just as vague as the Genesis passage about Enoch, as well as this passage. Well, Corey, I don't think that this was vague. Well, it is vague, because we don't have enough information. But where we get more information is when, uh, you remember when God takes on flesh? Jesus, we're gonna we're gonna break the rules and go ahead from where we are. Jesus is having a conversation. Jesus is talking about salvation. Jesus is talking about ultimately the final destination, going to be with the Father. You cannot be with the Father. There is no kingdom of heaven, no kingdom of God, unless you are what born again. He's having this conversation with Nicodemus, but he he says something a bit odd. He says, verse 11 of chapter 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things, you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Look what he says. No one has ascended into heaven. Wait a second. Stop the presses. No one has ascended into heaven. Except the Son of Man except he was ascended from heaven. He says, no one has ascended into heaven. Udes is nobody. No one, nothing has ascended, has bacon, has gone up. And this is, this is a perfect tense. Um, so nobody ever, you, you can't take this word bacon. You can't take this at, well, no one now. No, the tense of this, of this verb is predicate that he's using is speaking of even, listen, in the past, no one has gone into ice tone, uh, Uranon. No one has gone into the heaven. 
Someone go tell Kevin Zadot. Yeah, Kevin Zadot, no. <laughs> uh, no one has gone, it says, except, amen, um, except the one um, that's come down. That's the Son of Man. The only one that's ever gone up at this point that Jesus is making, no one at that time has gone up or come down into or out of heaven. That's Jesus' point. Now, we're, we're going to go more into it this week because this is the week where uh, we'll look back and talk about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and where he was gone for those uh, three days, what happened, why he was doing it, what was the whole point. But remember, suffice to say just for now, no one gets to go to the Father unless Jesus brings them. His death, burial, and resurrection, what his, re what his ascension accomplishes is that, so ask the question, what if Jesus had only died and resurrected but never ascended? They all have a point. And so those folks that are, that are at that time in the abode of the dead are there. So if they're taken up into the sky physically, they still find themselves, whether it be Enoch or Elijah, they found themselves there. Notice how no one comes back from the dead after Jesus's ascension. So I'll leave that there. But when uh, uh, when, when my beautiful bald head brother Ratman said, asked about that well that's why he died um or he was just gone he was taken up to heaven into the heavens to the sky and then however he made his way which on ramp he got off on which whatever he did not go to heaven there's still a lot of work that needs to be done for on jesus part that hadn't happened yet okay so no one has gone out, and I want to bring that out as well. Now, going back to this other prophet, the beautiful bald prophet, you know, the one that had a double anointing. So which prophet was uh, the more powerful prophet, the better prophet, the hairy prophet, or the beautiful bald prophet? The hairy prophet that we don't know if he had, I don't know, how did, how did you wash your hair back then? That was interesting. That's why... That is why it'd be better to be bald back then. But I digress. But here comes the beautiful bald prophet. And look what happens. After this, with this spring water, uh, so the waters have become purified to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. Here's a wonderful story here. Wonderful story right here. <laughs> I didn't earn that. Which I did earn that. CG said I didn't earn that. Well, no, the, he has a double anointing. I'm kidding. By the way, you notice that the, that the bald prophet never did what the hairy prophet did. The hairy prophet, woe is me. Uh, this woman is after me. There's nobody like, uh, not, not the bald prophet. <laughs> I'm kidding. I better stop. I better stop. Then he went up from there to Bethel. Uh, and as he was going up, by the way, young lads came out from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. How dare they? How dare they? Hmm? Hold on, wait a second. Hold on. You said ascended is the is the focus. Elijah didn't ascend, he was taken. It's, no, the, brother, it's, it's literally, it's the same work. It's the same, it's the same thing. No one has gone up. Um, the, the, the English word for us and it's fine that you bring it up. The English word for us, no one has ascended. This ascended might it might be translated into another language. I mean to another word. It depends on the translation. But the word is going up. However, you got there, irrespective. Anna the bacon. It there's no way that you can't get around that. So he got up. He went up. No one has ever gone up. Whether they were taken up or they flew up, they jumped up high, it doesn't matter. This word covers all that. So anyway, all right, go back to it. He says, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. They called him bald head twice. Don't they know? Don't. As though that's a bad thing. He should have turned around and said, you, you kids with hair. When he looked behind them uh, and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. He went from there to Mount Carmel and from there he returned to Samaria. Don't talk about people's heads. Okay? Don't talk about bald folks. 
It's almost like it's almost like saying um, to a beautiful woman, you're too beautiful. To a smart person, you, you're just too smart. No. Now, was this an accident or did the Lord? No, this happened on him. He says the Lord. He, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Amen. Now, I'm going to get to my point in just a second about the about these prophets. You said ascended denotes his own power. No, it doesn't. No, no, it doesn't. This, this, what you can't do, my friend, uh, he said, ascended den denotes his own power. Well, let's go back to the text. No one has ascended. What, what about this word makes you think that it, it connotes or means his own power? Because the question is going to be, well, what word would you use to say was taken up? You, this this word this word suffices. This word this this word suffices. As a matter of fact, Jesus uses this word of, of himself when he being sent or taken. So this word does it 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 doesn't state how he got up. If it was by force or he did it on his own. Okay. Oh, by the way, let's just be clear. Nobody ascends on their own. Nobody descends on their own. Okay. So going back to it, here is the point. Notice now there's other things that we're going to see with Elijah. Yes. Just like with what we saw with EJ, Elijah. Something we don't see today. Because this is showing us what a prophet looks like. I wish that every single human being on the planet that calls himself a prophet or herself a prophet. My question is, how in the world, how come you don't look like that prophet? True prophets of God, the ones that we see, come with some sort of power, at the very least, 100% accuracy. Now, these were two true prophets. These were two true prophets. The prophets that we see, the ones that will get on YouTube, Facebook, um, Instagram, TikTok, what else is out there? What are the, what, whatever. You guys don't look like this kind of prophet. Far from this kind of prophet are you. It's all, you know, you know what you look like? You look like a guy with green paint on his face calling himself Yoda. You and Yoda, nothing about you and Yoda. Now, obviously, Yoda is fictitious. And truth be told, these prophets today are fictitious. Meaning you are impersonating a prophet. You are claiming to be something that you're not. You neither have power nor do you have the word of God, that is, of those that are actual prophets, or I'm sorry, false prophets. If you say, well, that's not describing me. I am a true prophet of God. Why don't we know it? Notice whether it was Elijah, EJ, or Elisha, ES, everyone knew it, including the men that Ahaziah sends out. They know he's a prophet. They get it, including the commander of the 50s. He knows, and the people know. They know. As a matter of fact, even the king himself knew. Even Ahab knew. Even Jezebel knew. Everybody knows what a prophet is because they're not that difficult to, to spot. They're not that difficult to know. It's almost like if, if we saw a giraffe walk by us, we all know, hey, ladies and gentlemen, that's a giraffe. Odd that a giraffe would be walking down Main Street, USA, but that's a giraffe. Why? Because we know what a giraffe looks like. If you're in your bedroom at night and you hear dogs barking, you would say, that's a dog. Why? Because we even know what a dog sounds like without even seeing the dog. Why? Because we have seen dogs in the past. We have seen the works, the words of a prophet. But when you come and you give us something that looks nothing like that, and you get upset, just like the king did, 
because we don't believe your word or we're upset with your word. You need to understand the lengths that God will go through to avenge and to protect his name. So when you say you're a prophet, fine. If you're a prophet, like Paul says in Romans 12, you're a prophet, prophesy away. Get to prophesying some more. When, and this, this is one of the reasons why Muhammad hated the Jews. It's one of the reasons why Muhammad, you know, the founder of Islam, hated the Jews. Because he wanted to be, Muhammad wanted to be a prophet to the Jews. And if you all know that, he wanted to be a prophet to the Jews, and he goes in and he says, he tells them that I'm a prophet. So what do they say? Well, what do you think these Jews, who weren't living by the Lord, what do you think they said to Muhammad that just incensed him, just enraged him so much? Here comes Muhammad. Hey, guys. I'm a prophet. What do you think they said to him? Prophesy. Give us a prophecy. And he, yeah, CG, prove it. And because, because he couldn't, they just, yeah, Arsenal, they, you know what? Show me, show me something. We, had, we hadn't seen anything all day. We just been sitting around here doing nothing, you know, uh, shooting the breeze. Give us a prophecy. And when he didn't, they laughed at him. <laughs> they ridiculed him. Well, because like any insecure person would do, he wants to come back and get revenge. And by the way, I, to some degree, he did. That's why today's prophets, these false prophets, get upset. They get bothered. I mean bothered when you don't believe them. When Elijah's there and he's with the prophets of Baal, and you've got him versus these 800 plus prophets. These prophets of Baal and the Asherah, they're there. Did Elijah get bothered by them? They didn't believe in him. Now, initially they didn't. <laughs> they did later. He didn't get upset. But what did he do? He put on a demonstration, didn't he? They believed him afterwards. So you can always tell the mark of a true prophet because of where, where his confidence lies, plus, again, his track record. This is what a true prophet of God looks like. If you don't look like that, if you don't resemble him in any way, shape, from fashion, maybe not the miracles, maybe not the signs. Again, we've only seen a few periods in history where signs and wonders have shown up. And so even for those folks running around saying that all these signs and wonders are happening at their hands, remember, let's put it back on the screen. I'm coming to you, uh, Katrina. Let's put it back on the screen. Let's look at the times we've got uh, for the first thousand years or so, we don't see signs and wonders at the hands of a man. Then here comes Moses. Then we go from this time period of approximately, approximately a thousand years, 900,000 years later, we see, we see Elijah and Elisha. So we got a couple thousand years before there's no man having, having signs and wonders at his hands. Then we go another Six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years to another man. Then we go, let's put it back on the screen. When's the next time we see someone with these signs and wonders happening at their hand? We go from approximately 900 or what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Approximately 700, 600 uh, uh, BC. So another 600, almost 70 years, another six, 700 years before we begin to see another person with signs and wonders at their hand, that being obviously Jesus and the apostles. Now we've got folks saying, well, we got it all the time. That's all we see today. That's all we got is, is signs and wonders. Okay. Remember, that's not normal. That's not normal. Now, if you got it, fine. If you got it, fine. But God is going to use it for his glory. Not to say that, hey, these people are going to get a new car. God's going to bless you. That's not, we don't see that either. It's what a true prophet looks like, and his word means something. So, the next prophet that comes around, you don't have to give him a mirror, give him a Bible, and say, look at you, and look at this Bible, and you tell me, do you do? does what come out of your mouth? That's all you have to do. This right here, your lips, your tongue, your teeth, your cheeks, 
saliva, tonsils, if you still got them, uh, esophagus, larynx, all of that. Is that your responsibility as a prophet? Yes, because a prophet tells, a prophet informs, to utter, to speak, to give a revelation of God. If God, two things required, hear from God and then speak it. If you come back and say, well, I just misspoke, well, then you're not a prophet. You're not a prophet. It's like me trying to sing. I can't sing. Well, I just hit a bunch of bad notes. Well, then you're not a singer, Corey. That's all. Well, I just hit a bunch of bad keys on the piano. Well, you're not a piano player. It's not that difficult, but you said so. And so, therefore, you are going to be dealt with by God. Let me ask a couple of these questions. In light of the question or the topic, please explain the laying on of hands. Um, by the way, I don't believe uh, in false prophets. I know you don't, Katrina. That's why you're here. Um, the whole issue, it, this that part has gotten a little... Laying on of hands, there is a physical laying on of hands, but it's not necessarily a physical act. It's not always a physical act. It's just really giving approval. Um looking over, validating, verifying. So when Paul says, there are times, I don't, I laid hands on you guys, not necessarily saying on all of you, that's, that's, a, that's a long, lengthy task, just giving approval, validity over them. So that's really where that comes from. And now, but when you put your hand on someone physically, folks can literally see you saying, hey, that's my guy, that's my gal, that's my lady, that's my, that's my man, Okay. What's the difference between the gift of prophecy and being a prophet? A prophet is what you are. Prophecy is you can do it one time. For example, the difference between being a basketball player and playing basketball. I can go out right now and uh, play basketball. That made me a basketball player. Now, because of my bald head and the fact that I'm from Indiana, you might think with my skill set that I'm a basketball player, but I'm not. I'm kidding. Uh, I can go and, I don't know, uh, someone can sing a song, decent song doesn't make them a singer because they sing. And so that's that's the difference. Um, by the way, prophet is, this is God placing you there in that in that place. Prophecy is just something coming out of your mouth, giving a, a, a revelation declaration. What and what and what, what, what? What'd you say? Isn't the Holy Quran proof enough that the last prophet comes from a descendant of Ishmael. No, it's not. The, there are so many errors and bad prophecies in that Bible. For example, when the when the Quran says that the sun sets in a puddle of mud, well, that's just dumb. Sorry. When he says that there's there's medicinal purposes or value in the fly in the wings of a fly, that's not true. But what the Quran does tell them to do. If they were, if they were, if anyone were to take this book as prophecy, it tells you to listen to the people of the book, that's us, and don't doubt what we say about it. So, why do men today not understand the scriptures? Because it's easy to read into the scriptures. It's re It's easy to make um, it say what you think it says. If I can take what someone has been telling me and read that, how many of you have ever? Let's say, let, let me use this as, as an example. Let's say, let's say, let's say Chip. Uh, Chip just came around and let's say Krista is telling me about Chip. I've never met Chip. But Krista says, yeah, th that, that guy Chip, he's, uh, he's don't trust him. Uh, he's a liar. He's deceptive. He's all these things. Now, Krista could be lying. But what Chris has done is colored my view of Chip before I even before I even heard him, before I even spoke with him. So now how do I look at Chip? Like he's, yeah, like Chris said, no good. He's no good. Well, wait a second. That's how we do the Bible sometimes. Someone told us this, and so that's how we look at the Bible going forward. And it's hard. It's everyone has to deal with it. You have to deal with these presuppositions, these, these um preconceived notions, what we've been taught, what we've been told, and it's hard. Which is why when we go through this, all we except for today we didn't do it, but normally we only deal with what the text says up to this point. 
Okay. By the way, in the upcoming homework that you're going to get is about dealing with with um, figures of speech. How do you deal with figures of speech? How do you know something is a figure of speech? And so y'all look for that on on the uh, on the Patreon class coming up soon. So uh, because it's important when when we say that we have a literal grammatical historical hermeneutic. That means we also have to deal with the figures of speech, with the idioms, the metaphors, and so forth. Well, doggone it, why are you late? <laughs> he said, I, I'm sorry I'm late. It's okay. Glad you're here. Long As long as you made it. Rand, thank you for the super chat. Thank you so much. And Jeff says, and despite this passage, uh, giving you another two years. <laughs> Some of you guys, listen, I can promise you this, Jeff and the rest of you guys, um, Senior Conrad, you guys, maybe not Senior Conrad, Senior Conrad was born with a head full of hair. He'll die with a hair, hair full of, a head full of hair. But some of you other fellas that's going to lose your hair, you're going to look back on these videos and just thank me. You're going you're gonna to thank me. Yeah. Because, listen, think about the coolest people that you know in TV history and so forth. They were bald. They were bald. You had to work. Well, listen, tell your job. It's 5 p.m. Central Time. I'm taking a break. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> so, I'll give you that homework. Um, it won't be today because I have to leave and go um, hustle and bustle and fight at this airport and find my wife whose flight was changed. <laughs> so, I got to deal with that. There you go. There you go. Bald men, listen, I can't tell you how important bald men are to the world. Can't tell you how important we are to the world, but one day you guys will see. One day you guys will see. Anyway, thank you, Just Another Sheep. Again, guys, as who told us that we be sheeping? We are sheeping today. But I'll give you the homework uh, on tomorrow morning, so look out for that. Then you're also going to get a good run of, of videos, but I have to give you this other first. I have to give you this this other homework prior to the next set of uh, videos that come out, okay? Because it's going to help us with understanding the other videos that we go through. So, anyway, what about Second Timothy? Okay, doggone it, Katrina. You're not supposed to ask questions about um, verses in the New Testament, but because it's you, let me go to uh, Second Timothy one. What is it? Second Timothy one six. Okay, let me do this. You're making you're making me break the rule. Second Timothy one six. This says, for this reason, I remind you to continue content con kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, well, one this this is this is to, uh, to Timothy. This doesn't mean that that he received the Holy Spirit through his laying on of hands. But this is just through how, remember, Timothy is considered to be a son in Paul. That means that, that, that Timothy came to faith in Paul, but he was certainly grown up, developed because of Paul. Uh, we talk about, Paul even talks about Timothy's um, mother and his grandmother. Uh, so this this shouldn't be taken that that Paul is that Paul laid his hands on Timothy and Timothy received the spirit of God. Remember, because the spirit of God is given or the Holy Spirit and the gifts of it are given as the Holy Spirit gives. And so if that's the case, we've got a, we've got a contradiction. So, okay, what does Sheila say? Hold on, now, now I got to look before I go. <laughs> I have to look before I go. Um, Did Sheila say something? I don't see it. Sheila, Corey didn't see that. Didn't see what? Okay, hold on. Let me just type in Sheila. I'm sorry, guys. We're supposed to leave, but I have to see what Sheila did. Sheila, by the way, Sheila is the only, <laughs> the only moderator uh, that was banned and then brought back in. I forgot what did, I forgot what she did. She did something. Sheila did something, and I forgot what it was, but she did it, and then and then I had to take her take her away for 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 a little bit. <laughs> Stevie's a snitch. <laughs> what? Okay, I gotta find it. I gotta find it. I gotta find it. I don't see it. I don't see it. Oh, well. 
Oh, well, I'm sorry. Well, anyway, <laughs> to the best uh, group of moderators and the best group of um, YouTube chat members, you all are so wonderful. You all are so awesome. Thank you all so much. I've got to now venture onto this highway and to go to, um, I don't even know which, which airport is it. Oh, I should know that, huh? We got two airports here to go pick up my wife. So anyway, all right, ladies and gentlemen, love you all so much. Oh, by the way, um, no, I won't ask a question. I won't ask a question. I was going to ask you, you guys about someone else, but I'll, I'll go and look for myself. That way no one can say, um, answer me out. It's okay. Answer her. What was her question? Can you help me rebut someone who believe that there are more than 200 books in the Bible uh, in the, and the Vatican is keeping them all hidden? <laughs> no, I can't. Why? Because you cannot, you cannot argue with foolishness. Ask them to name them. Ask that person to name those 200 books. And ask that also after they name the 200 books so we can go and investigate ourselves, how do they know they're hidden? There's, there's a, you can't. Some, dear sister, there's just some people you, you just won't be able to argue with. And so for me, I just, this is just me. I, I like when people say goofy things, I like to give it back to them. And so I just say, okay, well, name them. Name, name all of those books. And then how do we know they're hidden? Because if you can name them, then how are they hidden? So anyway, all right, ladies and gentlemen, love you so much. V Spell, yes, definitely watch the replay. Uh, we've got a, a bunch of videos this week. A bunch of videos this week. We'll be getting getting into the end time stuff and some other things. Plus, this is the this is Easter week. We're gonna talk about the word Easter. Why that's not a big deal. Anyway, guys, love you all so much. Lord willing, I will see you all tomorrow.